on the official website viceland.com I have been able to watch two of the uh, uh, six episodes of the new Vice series Dark Side of the Ring. This is a series that takes a look at the biggest mysteries, tragedies and obviously as the name suggests the, the darker sides of the professional wrestling industry. There's some really good potential episodes coming up. Other uh, topics that will be covered include uh, the fabulous Mula and Von Eriks. This is it. These episodes are not going to be, I believe, aired in the UK on television until around about June. But on Viceland.com, there is a link to to what be able to watch uh, the two episodes of A Match Made in Heaven, the episode regarding the Match Man Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth and the killing of Bruiser Brody, uh, obviously to do to deal with the sad uh, and tragic events that happened in Puerto Rico. First of all, the episode regarding Macho Man and uh, Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth. This, uh, both these episodes are about 44 minutes long, so they'll last about an hour with television adverts. Luckily, uh, there was only literally maybe two minutes of adverts, so... Uh, but every 10 minutes, so it still lasted almost an hour, my viewing of these two episodes, but e the episodes themselves are about 44 minutes long. The episode, the, f the first episode that I saw about Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth started very briefly chronicling the backstory uh, of Randy Savage, and it does really concentrate a lot more on Macho Man than Miss Elizabeth's background and talk t talking really about him rather than her, which I think was a little bit sad, but don't think really the, a lot of private information has really been out there about Miss Elizabeth. It uh, charts ra uh, Randy's uh, background, his father Angelo, his brother Lanny, who we see often throughout the episode talking about uh, both Randy and uh, Miss Elizabeth, their marriage, their relationship, and basically life, their life in general. Uh, and we hear briefly about him, how his rise up in wrestling uh, and eventually his contract with the WWE or World Wrestling Federation as it was at that point, including of course the story of him uh, going to a gym at 6am and meeting Miss Elizabeth for the first time and he proclaiming uh, that it was love at first sight and she said well it took a while. Uh, we don't hear obviously hear from her in it or anyway from her side again which is a bit of a sad uh, kind of situation. We never, uh, I am not sure what her family situation was entirely but uh, we don't really hear from her side of things, which is a great shame because it's never really been aired um, in the rest. I don't know whether there's anybody, to be honest, uh, that is able to, to, to say that. A lot of the time of the documentary is regarding their time in the, as I said then, World Wrestling Federation, especially in particular the storylines of the Mega Powers, which was the team of the Macho Man and Hulk Hogan, who... We kind of hear through his ex-wife, Linda Belea, we hear her uh, from her about her relationship a little bit with Terry Hogan and uh, also a lot about, of course, her friendship with Elizabeth and um, they really take you through the kind of, some of the biggest story, like, well, not really exactly through them, but they highlight what was going on at the time in the, uh, in the mid to late 1980s of the storylines that were going on, the initial kind of on-screen kind of mistreatment, if you will, um, that Macho Man would give Miss Elizabeth, and how fans would obviously, because kayfabe and the workings of the wrestling business, although it was known a little bit at that time, uh, it's not as no well known or uh, now. You know, fans are more educated. Although this maybe this perhaps might be real, and they do lay it out at the start that. This is the character of the Macho Man, rather than Randy Poffo, the gently the, the actual person. Um, it's laid out as if to expect. Well, this is not what you hear about Macho about Randy, and his treatment as a, of Elizabeth, whether it be inside or outside the ring, away from the the wrestling um, shows. This is kind of the character that he's portraying, which I felt. Yeah, okay to a degree, because it, we are told basically that Randy is portraying a character and that uh, I think it's Jimmy Hart who, uh, uh, and others who 
um, contribute to this as an interview that's cut with kind of recreations of actors portraying and I, I will say I think the actor that portrays the Macho Man he actually kind of looks, looks to me especially in one of the close up bits because um, you don't really see them because there's a lot of it because they're all obviously lookalikes but in one bit when he comes up really close to the camera quite early on I think he actually looks like Michael P.S. Hayes it's not Michael P.S. Hayes but he kind of looks like um, Michael P.S. Hayes the fabulous freebird uh, we are told that Macho Man was portraying a character to be honest, as time goes on, as the documentary goes on, I'm not too sure that that is exactly what it was. I think Randy was basically the macho man character, the, the kind of jealous type, the possessive type. Yet, I, I mean, I don't think we've ever really heard, I, I will say, of instances where that he was abusing Elizabeth. I will say that. I... I don't, I don't think there is any evidence or any real belief. I don't think that the WWE wrestlers at that time would have really put up with it because uh, Miss Elizabeth was so liked. I don't think um, there was any evidence that he was actually like, that it was a continual abusive relationship. Um, so I don't believe that was the actual case. Uh, as the document goes on, it deals with the mega powers and the mega powers exploding and Basically, at the same time, Miss Elizabeth and Macho Man's relationship, it kind of falling apart, disintegrating. It's a very well known fact that marriages in wrestling don't tend to work, especially if both partners are involved in wrestling. Uh, which, well, certainly in the 1980s, uh, you know, Macho Man, some people will say we well, can't blame the wrestling, especially in those days, it was full of egos and politics which it still is but it's a lot of testosterone and very highly competitive and the real male kind of ego type driven um, surroundings of the WWE in those days you kind of understand the match over I said he was very he seemed a very possessive man um, jealousy but je got jealous very easy I mean the story that is told in the documentary which I've heard before about uh, Hogan, uh, Hulk Hogan filming uh, one of the movies, I think it was, was it Suburban Commando, one of the, the movies, I think it may have been Suburban Commando, um, down in Florida, Miss Elizabeth um, basically trying to get his, uh, trying to get Matchman's permission to go down and help Linda, uh, Hulk Hogan's wife, well then wife, with the children and spend some time kind of almost kind of by herself but out of away from like on the road and kind of away from the macho man if I'm honest and then him eventually kind of well getting basically getting jealous and coming going down there and dragging her back uh, basically taking her back home uh, so I, I do feel that macho man was a little bit of a possessive part of it. I'm not going to go into the huge details I, I never do on these kind of review things because I want people to actually watch the episodes themselves and make their own decision but certainly I think although we are told right initially this is Matt, this is Randy, the man Randy Savage playing a character I think he pretty much was like like a lot of the wrestling the most successful wrestling uh, characters it's that person but dialed way up to 10 or 11 um, you know uh, as the old joke goes uh, you know they're, 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 it's themselves but they're dialed way up and I think actually eventually the Macho Man, he may have started as maybe a small, maybe a slightly meeker guy, and the Macho Man was the kind of character I think he kind of grew as to being the Macho Man. Whether it was being around, being the Macho Man constantly, because he was always on the road every single day. Whether that contributed to it, I'm not entirely sure. May have done. You know, you've got to live that gimmick, as Jimmy as Jimmy Hart says it. I think it was Jimmy Hart, um, and I know I'm saying that. Uh, it's Jimmy Hart, but um, certainly it's Jimmy Hart. Certainly Dutch Mantel, I think, is, says better that um, the your the character you expect that you're in the ring, you're always expected to be. When people meet you, they, they have it, those because the fans have the expectation of you being that over the top personality. So kind of often you have to be that uh, the, that kind of person. The kind of documentary moves on, and it does tell the story of uh, slightly. Uh, um, or briefly of Macho Man joining WCW I said there 
their marriage fell apart, they ended up divorcing. Randy still got Miss Elizabeth a job in World Championship Wrestling uh, when he after he joined. Uh, and it moves on and tells the story about how Miss Elizabeth and Lex Luger got together and it eventually covers a very tr the tragic end of Miss Elizabeth uh, in uh, 2003. Uh, it actually plays, and this is, I wasn't, I was kind of, oh, do they need to play that? It sounds like they're playing, and I'm not sure where, the tape, where they got the tape from, but it does sound like they're playing the actual tape which I'm pretty sure it is the actual tape of Bluger's 911 call uh, when he notices Miss Elizabeth isn't breathing. And you do hear from Lex Luger a little bit during that kind of part of the documentary. I believe it, I'm not sure exactly where they got the tape from. I meant to check the credits for, uh, before, uh, try and check the credits before I tape this, but uh, I think it may have been from the, uh, the Eric Bischoff um, podcast interview, because Eric appears later on, as obviously he dealt with both of them in World Championship Wrestling. It's just not completely told that World Championship Wrestling is all about an anon. We know that um, around about 96, 95, 96 I think it was. Uh, it was about 95. It was a 94, 95 kind of time period he moved on to World Championship Wrestling. Um, and I said, we kind of get to hear a little bit about that time but very, very briefly it's, uh, his time in, in that company is, is covered. Uh, like I said, one of the things about this documentary is it doesn't really go into Miss... El uh, I, mean, no, I mean, basically the only person that's speaking for Miss Elizabeth is Linda Belair, uh, Hogan's ex-wife. Uh, and she obviously talks... I mean, I, I don't disbelieve it, what she says. She talks a lot about their friendship and what, was what she was told was going on between Miss Elizabeth and Randy and, uh, you know, the times on the road and the friendships and spending time together as a couple and family when obviously Hogan uh, and Linda's kids came along um, uh, such as that story I read earlier about Miss Linda wanting, you know, being very close to the children um, and wanting to come down to help while Hogan is spending I think it's eight weeks in Florida and, uh, uh, it's like you it, it's a good documentary where you get to hear about uh, Randy and Miss Elizabeth's relationship and although it doesn't, like I said, I don't know whether there is anybody there, it does to me miss a little bit out where there is nobody really apart from Linda speaking for Miss Elizabeth and giving her background and I mean you hear that she was working in the gym when she met Randy but other than that her personal life and her, she's not really represented in this story which is unfortunate, I don't think, there, like I said, I, not believe, I don't believe there may be anybody who really can represent Miss Elizabeth. I don't know what her family situation exactly was. Um, there's never really been the Miss Elizabeth story told from, oh, this is how, no, this is her beginnings and this is what she did and then, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, obviously there's a Wikipedia page, but there's no nobody really to, this, to, 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 to stand up and tell, really, this is the story of Elizabeth Shulett, I believe her, uh, her name was. Uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, you know, this is the Elizabeth Shulip, um story. It's a very sad ending when she stopped breathing when she's, um, it seems she gets into drugs a lot with Lex Luger, that's well documented. Um, and it's, it's just a very sad ending to, you know, the first lady of wrestling. Um, so it's a good documentary, 44 minutes long. There's a lot. As an educated wrestling fan, I would consider myself a bit of an educated wrestling fan that doesn't really come up the end of World Championship Wrestling. How did that affect Lex Luger and Miss Elizabeth? How did it affect their relationship? It doesn't really delve into Lex's and her relationship. Um, I, I don't know whether they got whether they wanted Lex involved, whether he refused, or you know, I, I don't know. Uh, but certainly, it's a very har harrowing tale. It's a, it starts off well. You can see they're both eventually, you know, kind of, they grow apart and Miss Elizabeth grows a lot as a person. It just, I don't know what exactly what to think of this documentary. I'm going to have to watch it again. It's a good documentary. I certainly would recommend watching it. Um, both obviously very sadly passed away since, I said, Miss Elizabeth in 2003 and then Randy after a heart attack while driving in, uh, 2000, in May 2011. Um, very good documentary, uh, very good episode that I watched. It just, I think people will 
um, interpret it their own way. I'm going to keep this going and uh, make this a long episode because the second episode is the episode that I really, uh, well, I, I think it says it's episode three, but the second episode that I watched uh, is certainly one that also is, um, although there are dark periods and dark things in the Macho Man and Elizabeth episode, the second episode that I've watched, the killing of Bruiser Body is certainly... Uh, an episode that I think is one of the darkest, most horrific episodes in professional wrestling history. This episode deals with basically the murder, in my own opinion, of Frank Goodish, a.k.a. Bruiser Brody. Now this episode I actually, quite interestingly, is narrated by... But uh, most of the episodes, I believe, in, uh, are in are narrated by Dutch Mantel, who I mentioned now appears in the uh, s slightly in the Macho Man episode. Uh, obviously, he's much more involved, um, Dutch Mantel, in this episode because as anyone who knows about Dutch Mantel, he's been involved in Puerto Rico wrestling scene for years. He was a quite a decent star there, a booker, a writer there, basically. Um, and very well involved in the comedy. This one isn't straightforward and I don't think the truth is well, absolutely shown here completely um, in this episode. This story, this episode uh, basically kind of chronicles the events of the day of, I believe it's 16th of July 1988. Uh, what happened in a, uh, a place called Bayamon, Puerto Rico. Uh, the World Wrestling Council, WWC, uh, which at least was, I'm not sure whether it's still going, I, I, I don't I don't do a huge amount of research uh, before, but I wanted to review these with when it's fresh in my mind. Uh, the WWC, World Wrestling Council in Puerto Rico was, at least one, uh, I think at that point, one of, or if not the biggest uh, wrestling company in Puerto Rico. I believe eventually there was two uh, companies, but certainly it's a more infamous uh, Puerto Rican wrestling company. And these event, the events of the 16th of July 1988 um, basically happened in the dressing room well before the show, which actually ended up happening, which it was still, if you look at it, it certainly was a weird decision. And I think, um, as Tony Atlas explains, he, it was a bit of a weird decision to carry on the show. But the events actually happened all in the locker room where a gentleman, I'm going to say a gentleman, a guy, a guy, let's get this right, a guy, called Jose Gonzalez stabs Frank Goodish Bruiser Brody to death. That is what happened. Now, I will say in the interest of balance, and just again, all of these, all of this, what I'm talking about, my video and every video is always my opinion based on what I've seen, experienced, or gathered from what my thoughts and my experiences of watching a documentary or through life or whatever. It's all my opinions, and I will say that. Because I'm going to say, every time the Bruiser Brody story is told, we always get it from the story, from the, uh, from the basically the standpoint of that Bruiser Brody's the good guy. He's kind of the baby face, as you would say, in wrestling, and Jose Gonzalez is the bad guy, the villain of the piece. I'm only saying that because first, I believe that is absolutely the truth. I think Frank Goodish was the good guy, and you hear. Um, from his widow Barbara and his son Jeff about he, who he was as a person throughout and including, uh, they look at a lock up with a lot of Bruiser Brody merchandise and photos and everything. You never hear from the side of Jose Gonzalez, I believe him, Carlos Colon were, uh, and a couple, uh, a couple uh, I can't remember the other, the other guy's name uh, that was involved in the Puerto Rican company. Um, we never hear from his side we do hear a bit of motivation in the stabbing of the uh, Bruiser Brody and uh, Jose Gonzalez, who was known as Invader One, had a match. Um, Bruiser Brody was a very hardcore guy, which is why Fra uh, Mick Foley um, narrates and a little bit presents at the start um, the episode. He talks about how how when he got tapes, the first got tapes of Bruiser Brody, how it blew his mind and. 
became an instant fan of Bruce and Brody and wanted to be that kind of wrestler, which Mick Foley was. Anybody who knows Mick uh, realises that he was. Bruce Brody was a big hardcore wrestler, lots of blood and guts, and Puerto Rico, which was one of the places in, um, as well as Japan that Brody very frequented. He was a major, major star in Japan, of all Japan, which you hear throughout, which, you, which, which is shown a little bit in this documentary. Puerto Rico is one of the most infamous wrestling areas or territories in the entire world. It's blood, it's guts. The fans are literally riotous. They will throw stones, as we hear from Abdullah the Butcher, is also um, featured in this, and I will get to him in a moment, because it's something I want to say about him. Throw, they will throw stones and rocks and stab people, wrestlers. Uh, they will literally riot. They will literally cause a lot of damage. They, um, you know, Puerto Rico is a very dangerous... I don't know what it's like nowadays... I think it's still a little bit the same from what I've heard, um, from like to Cole Cabana going there, um, other wrestlers that have gone there. I believe it's still a little bit like that, but again, like I was talking about the, the Macho Man episode, kayfabe and, it, and the truth about how wrestling works is more out there these days than it was. Um, we're talking now eight, 1988, so we're talking what, 10, 20, 30, almost, about 40 years ago now. So. Um, so the information about how wrestling works is more out there, but Puerto Rico is definitely a very dangerous. If the re if the fans hated you for whatever reason, whether you were being a villain uh, or you were terrible, which is the different kinds of so-called heat there is, the fans will go after you. They will damage and wreck your car, your transport. Uh, there are numerous stories over the years of people having to be um, escorted out of... Uh, Places like Puerto Rico, uh, hidden trunks of other wrestlers' cars, so they can get out there safely. You know, Puerto Rico is a very dangerous territory. Um, what is absolutely fantastic about this episode? It's not. I mean, these both these episodes are not like well speculating of this might have happened, that might have happened. We hear from people who were there, including Mister USA Tony Atlas, who you know, I've never met the gentleman, uh, and I will call him a gentleman because. Um, but he seemed to, uh, there's lots of different stories about Tony Atlas, but um, he's a bit of an unusual guy, which to be honest, he's a wrestler, so what do you expect? Um, but he, I, I believe, I basically believe at least most of what he says to be true, um, that he, as he recounts the story of that night, the 16th of July, 1988, as I said, uh, and about how, he, you know, he, Dutch Mantel, and Bruce Brody were in basically in the dressing room. Dutch Mantel, you know, you could there was different things that lead up to it. Um, you know, Bruce Brody was supposed to be you know, he was a huge, huge star in Puerto Rico. He was supposed to, expected to be picked up, but nobody appears. So Dutch and Tony Atlas uh, say, "Oh, come with us. We're going. To, you know, we're on the same show. You know, we're you know, come with us. We're friends." Well, let's go to the stadium together. So eventually, they go. They can feel pretty much the tension in the air. Dutch Mantel eventually goes for uh, to for a walk, kind of a, a a walk. He he can he, he feels the tension. I I don't know why, but maybe he just thinks it's so. Oh, oh, I'm just feeling nervous about the show. Um, you know, I said it was a rough territory at that time, at least. Um, he goes for kind of a walk and they sit in the dug one of the dugout because I think it's like a baseball pitch it's kind of baseball stadium that they were at so he goes sits in a dugout and um, watches the fans come in and um you know uh anyway so he's kind of out of the picture but then tony atlas sitting a bit basically jose gonzalez uh invites bruce Brody into the kind of the shower area and that's the non as i say in the documentary it's nothing unusual i've had it even before even wrestlers um at events um, uh, one of the open air events at Slicer gardens uh where a, a local company did it um two of the wrestlers were um, not even kind of even um, obviously I'm not a wrestler and I'm involved in the company uh, that's part part of it but the wrestlers will kind of go over their match because they two were supposed to wrestle um, you know so they wanted maybe they wanted to go over the match and see right I'll do this and then you do that this you know lay out some of the match and then you know this is right and this is how we'll finish the match they they do it and tend to do it in secret uh, but then uh, when Bruiser Brody goes into the shower there's he gets stabbed and um, eventually, you know, quite quickly, 
really. Uh, Tony Atlas realises what's going on. He thought he got punched first, thought Invader punched him. Maybe, you know, there's some wrestlers will do that in a locker room. They'll even go, right, I'll punch you there. Oh, uh, you know, I'll punch you there, you know, I'll do this and kind of physically lay out the match a little bit. I'll, you know, I'll grab the, 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 thing, the, the hand here and I'll go and we'll pull, go over to the rope and I'll stretch your hand so you can be like, you know, kind of be like you're, 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 like you're trying to almost pull the, you get the audience, you know, pull, you know, hold, uh, you know, pull me out of this, help me, you know, that kind of thing, trying to react to the crowd, like, help me crowd, help me crowd, kind of thing, um, and I think that's kind of what maybe Tony Atlas thought was ha was happening at first, uh, but, um, as I said, Tony Atlas, Mr. USA, quickly realises that, um, that Bruiser Brody was stabbed, and he eventually tried to cut him away from Jose Gonzalez, and, uh, basically, uh, it, it, it really kind of disintegrates into a big cover-up, in my opinion. Really does. Um, you know, Jose Gonzalez is allowed to leave, go and change his shirt, and then he comes back, and um, uh, for some reason he appears again. You know, he, he, he goes and he kind of, I think, gets rid of the murder weapon, in my opinion. Changes his shirt, which got ripped during the, the all, kind of altercation, where he's, uh, a little bit of altercation, was during the stabbing, at least. And then he returns. Um, I, I, I it certainly it, it devolves into a, what I believe was a cover up because nothing really happened. Jose Gonzalez eventually goes on trial and gets acquitted from uh, self defence. And Dutch Mantel, who I believe I don't believe Dutch Mantel after listening to him um, uh, on different various podcasts through years, including his own that he used to do. Um, I don't believe Dutch Mantel is a liar. I believe what he says to be genuine. I believe. Um, what Tony Atlas says to be genuine, um, so uh, I believe what that happens is they don't receive, they don't get contacted, and I think Dutch Mantel doesn't re uh, receive the summons to go to the trial, and until about at least ten days after the trial has actually ended, and Jose Gonzalez has been acquitted. Uh, it's a really horrible situation that that that. Uh, that episode, you know, the, to literally deal with the death of a man, a man who was very well well respected, and I will say, like I said, I, I was going to say about Abdul the Butcher, Abdul, I don't really believe what he says in, in its entirety. I don't believe what what um, Abdul has said. I believe he, he. I think he's got a conflict of interest. He says it during the during the episode that he owned. 5% of the company. I think he's got a conflict of interest in saying what happened. He denies there was a wrestler's meeting um, afterwards between likes of him, the foreign wrestlers himself and Dutch Mantel and Tony Atlas, which Dutch says happened, plus also Tony Atlas says happened. So I I, I firmly believe it did happen. Uh, whether Abdullah the Butcher was actually there, I'm not sure, or whether he was there and not just not paying attention to it and just like, Okay, because he owned 5% of the company. But also what I do believe, though, is that Abdullah wanted to get the heck out of there. He wanted to wash his hands, literally wash his hands of the situation, book the flight away from there back home to Canada, I think it is. He lived in the United States, North America. I know in Puerto Rico is going to, I believe it's like a territory of, of the United States. But he wanted to get out of, off the island of Puerto Rico. And I think it's his bad luck and I'm glad of it, that he runs into uh, Bruiser Brody's widow at the airport when she's been, when she's eventually got in contact with Dutch Mantel and Dutch says, yeah, you better come over at series because at that time, um, the last he heard and Tony Atlas did go to the hospital and you hear all about that. Uh, but at that time they thought he was serious but he was stable uh, and that they th I think they thought at that point he would survive so they tell his widow Barbara uh, to come over, which she does with uh, her son Jeff, and I think it's karma a little bit that Abdullah trying to get out of there. In my own, again, in my own personal opinion, I think he's trying to get the heck out of there, and he runs has a little bit of bad he has the bad luck, which yeah, good on him. Good, uh, well, good. Let's say good on him. Good on karma um, that he ends up running into Barbara and has to be the one to break the news that in fact um, at that point he uh, that Broser, uh, Bruiser Brody has passed away. I think it's a little bit of karma that he's the one that breaks the, 
the news when he's trying to get out of there and get away from the situation. Like I said, conflict of interest, I think, comes into it. Abdullah is... N I don't think he's one of the most trustworthy person from what, from what I've heard over the years. Um, but I think it's kind of a bit of a karma that he trying to get out of there and wash his hands and oh, I'm just a five percent owner of the company or uh, he's Abdullah Butcher is a big was a big major superstar, I'm not denying that. I think it was a bit of conflict of interest and I think he was trying to get the heck out of there and ended up running and uh, running up into Barbara at the airport. I don't know whether he stuck around. I don't know whether he broke the news to her and then left her on her own and went away. I that part wasn't I don't think said. Um, I would kind of hope not, but I get the feeling that he probably went, he probably, whether he missed his flight talking to her, I don't know, but I kind of get the feeling maybe he kind of broke the news to her, she thought he was basically a friend of hers and a trustworthy person and a friend of Bruiser Brody, um, because he was actually in the other locker room, you'll hear about it, he was in the heel locker room because there were two separate locker rooms uh, um, uh, at, that, at that point, um, and, and that I'm not sure whether it's good, whether it's good guy and bad guy locker rooms, or whether it was just because of the space there. There was two locker rooms. I'm not entirely sure uh, on that. I'm so I'm not going to say specifically. Um, but I think Abdullah certainly wanted to get the heck out of there and had the misfortune. Uh, well, he thought misfortune to run into Barbara, but I'm, I'm not sure what his acts, actions were immediately after. But um, I don't believe very much of what he says, to be honest. Unfortunately, in this documentary. Um, I know this is a really, really long video, but I wanted to do both episodes together. I really would suggest checking the episodes out. Um, I'm certainly, I don't know whether they're going to upload to Viceland.com all six episodes, um, but I'm certainly going to check them out. I really enjoyed these two episodes. Uh, there's not a huge amount, as I said, I'm a kind of slightly educated wrestling fan. There's not a huge, huge amount of new information in these two episodes because I've heard about these situations before. Um, but the like, ones like the Fabulous Moolah one, the one Eric's, I don't know whether there'll be anything much new. But I'm certainly going to, when I have the opportunity to watch the other four episodes uh, that are going to be uh, screened, I believe, so in the UK or internationally in June, uh, I'm certainly going to be sitting down and watching them when I have the opportunity to do that. Uh, so... Dark Side of the Ring by Vice, certainly two good episodes um, for myself to get off the series. I'll certainly be looking out um, for the other two thirds of the documentary series. But uh, I would certainly recommend if you're a wrestling fan, sit down, watch them. I'm going to re watch them at some point in the next couple of days. Um, and people can make up their own minds about the relationship between the Macho Man Randy Savage and the occurrences on that fateful day in Bayamon, Puerto Rico, where Bruiser Brody sadly lost his life.